If I had the extra hour, I'd have to talk about all the things I've seen on Facebook about each and every one of you. Isn't it terrible that we live in a world where people delight in sharing little nuggets and bit pieces of information? I really haven't seen or heard anything about you on Facebook. I don't even know how to get on to Facebook. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. But when you come here, you should know, well, I'm going to come and everything is positive. Now, even if it strikes you the wrong way, it's positive. Because when the word of God challenges us to change, that's positive. That's a good thing. And I trust that'll be the case. We have on the magazine rack, and it's got some other supplies and tools out there, it's a magazine called Voice of the Martyrs. If you're discouraged, if you feel like, oh man, things are really upside down and are going wrong in my life, I would encourage you to pick up this little magazine. When you read through it, you'll find stories that are absolutely inspirational. These are simple, humble people who do not have the opportunities we have. They do not have the, the abilities we have by way of their education and, and having been in a Bible-believing, teaching church. But these individuals inspire me. I look through every one that comes, and when I get done, I think to myself, Lord, what a mess I am. Because I get so easily distracted by the things of this world. I read an article during the first hour. I won't reread it, but you can't really see. But there are two men on this little half page. Let me read to you that these two men, uh, one is 80, the other is 73. They left their home at about 7 a.m. as usual and spent a few hours distributing Christian booklets and sharing the gospel. This is in Indonesia the largest Muslim country in the world. When a woman's son later showed the booklet to some Muslim friends, they became enraged at its content, which included a testimony of a Muslim man who had come to Christ. Sometime later, a group of young Islamists approached the two Christian men and began to beat Andreas. Then, when the police arrived, they took Andreas and Bittang into custody to question them about their activities. These men were detained for two days before being formally arrested. Then, in March 2019, they were convicted of blasphemy and sentenced to eight months in prison. Andreas said he wishes he would have received a longer sentence so he would have more time to share the gospel with the 1,200 other inmates in prison. What an incredible testimony. At a day when all of us would say, well, you men have served long enough, you've served hard enough. Here they are diligently, as was their practice, going out early in the morning to share the gospel. Well, that's a great testimony for all of us when we get discouraged, and that happens to all of us, doesn't it? What we need to remember is it will soon pass. I mean, just hang on. That moment, that time, it's like the weather. It'll move in, and then it'll move out. And like a farmer, when the weather gets good again, we need to be diligent working in the Father's fields. Well, the message today really involves all of that. It talks about how we should live in these, the last days. Now, this is an interesting message in that we're going to be speaking of a chapter, almost two chapters, and we're not going to read a single verse from it. In fact, if you look at your notes, you might think, wait a minute, all there is on the notes is a letter, a, a, a collection of scriptures. We're going to read that together. Don't read it during church. And I can tell when your eyes are down and you're reading. Don't do it. We'll read it together. 
But this is a very important time in this last week for Christ. We're going to find him on the Mount of Olives, Olivet as it's sometimes referred to. This is by far one of his favorite places. In this last week, this Passion Week, in the scriptures, we find that he has been there on three occasions. Now, the first time was when he came into the city. He came through Olivet. And there the, peoples, the people welcomed him and cried out these great prophetic words. Hosanna, Hosanna, here he is. He's coming. Our king is coming. And if you remember, the people started to turn, even in those first couple of days. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are, are interrogating him and trying to trip him up and trick him with their arguments. And Jesus has been in the temple on more than one occasion. And every time he goes, there's creation. I mean, there's a controversy created. And now we find that he keeps going back to the Mount of Olives. This time he goes there and he sits down and he teaches a long lesson, gives a long Bible study on what is going to happen. Now the reason that conversation has started is he's already said on at least two occasions this week, he's spoken about in the context of his parables, there is a day coming when this city will pay a price. And for the Jews, that was very disturbing. What does he mean? What is he talking about? So he sits down and he begins to explain. And the story creates a lot of questions for the apostles, as really it does today. Because we think, I don't understand exactly where all the parts are fitting together. Some of it was fulfilled in A.D. 70, when Rome came in, destroyed the city, scattered the people, and leveled every block of the temple. But there are many things in there that we'll hear people make reference of. Wars and rumors of war, earthquakes, and things like that. A lot of phrases we're familiar with that comes from the Olivet Discourse. Now, it is found in three places. We're only going to reference uh, a general outline, and we've highlighted those in Matthew chapter 24 to 25, verse 46. The theme is a little bit like this. People get ready. How many already know the next line in the song? People get ready. There's a train a coming. Remember that song? That was written in 1965 by Curtis May. It's one of those songs that's been recorded over and over and over again. I mean, everybody seems to know the song. It was written in the midst of the Vietnam War and all of the, the demonstrations then. The racial riots were happening. And Curtis May, influenced by his grandmother preacher, wrote these words. Now, it never speaks of Jesus. It never speaks of God. It never really mentions heaven, but that's obviously the theme. People, get ready. There's a day coming. That should be our theme song. Perhaps not this song, but that sentiment. That as a people, pilgrims living in a strange land, anticipating, eagerly anticipating a time when we will go to our home, the home we've never been to, the home we long for, what we need to do is we need to get ready because that day is coming and Jesus is talking to his disciples and those people who have gathered there in that cool place in the Mount of Olives and there they're going to talk about the future. Now, Jesus says, listen, you won't understand everything I'm saying, but this is what will happen to Israel. Now, when you read a lot of prophecy books, you'll find pages in there, and they'll talk about prophecy, and if you're not careful, they'll begin to mix up two very important players. Sometimes in the Bible, they are intertwined, but we need to understand that in certain places, the prophetic message 
is given to the people of God, the Jews. And Jesus said, listen, nation, this is what you will experience. These are the things that will happen before I come back to set up my kingdom. It was a mystery to the people of that day. We began to see a little bit of it when Paul begins to go everywhere and he is preaching the gospel in all of these Gentile cities. He always speaks to the Jews first and then he goes to the Gentiles and he's speaking to the Gentiles, the group we call the church. And now we see that God has a great movement It really has gone all the way around this world. And this is the gospel as it goes from place to place through the ministry of the church. So those are two separate groups. They both share a common history, a common thread in the prophecy. Now Beth and I were at a conference a week and a half ago. I think it was there. And I saw one of the cruelest jokes any parent could ever do to their kid. We have some babies coming. It is appropriate for me to say that Brucellina and Brucella has not, neither one of those have been used yet. All right. So if there's a girl, think about it, pray about it. All right. But in this listing, looking at all the people, There was a guy there named Alan Allen, A-L-A-N-A-L-L-E-N. Who would ever do that to your kid? Alan Allen. I mean, you would never know if they were calling you by your first name or your last name and whether or not it would matter. I guess it really wouldn't matter. Can you imagine all the confusion he's had to deal with, first with, Why did your mom do that? I mean, that'd be the first question. And maybe there's a family history, but it would be really confusing to live with two first names. Prophecy is a little bit like that. When we read a passage here and a passage over here, we sometimes get mixed up and we say, wait a minute, is this going to the church or is this going to the nation of Israel or is it going to both and does it really matter? We're not going to solve all those problems, but I'd like to review for you just a little bit what was given to the nation of Israel, what was given to the church. These are the two big hinges that the door of history and prophecy swing on. Everything that's happening in the world today in some way is related to what's happening in Israel and the church and God's prophetic calendar. So let me list for you what some of the things were that Jesus talked about to these people concerning the nation of Israel. I'll write these down. I can have them sent to you if you're interested in the, the papers. Or if you want to, just go to, you. where, am I, where are you going to go? GotQuestions.org. How many have used it this week? Only two of you are right with God. The rest of you are miserable sinners. We should have that extra hour. If you ever come with, man, I'm not sure what that really means. I suggest you look it up in gotquestions.org and you'll find fascinating reading. Only go if you have an hour. Because when you read the first article, there'll be another one right behind it that will discuss it. And it's easy to be in that site for an hour and say, wow. What a great hour of learning I just had by simply reading through these concise biblical articles. So you can get this information there. But here's what Israel needs to know. Here's what the nation needs to know. In A.D. 70, the people scattered, and for over 1,800 years, Satan's plan was to destroy the people. You can follow that history all the way through the early days in the Middle East, the days in Europe during the Middle Ages. 
You can follow the persecution all the way through till you get to World War II and millions of Jews were butchered. Why does this happen? Because Satan, who is the God of this world, hates the Jewish nation because he knows that all of prophecy is connected in one way or the other to this land and to this people. So here are some of the things that are happening, and we'll see them continue to happen to various degrees, but here they are. There'll be a mass return of Jews to the land of Israel. We've already seen that. 1948, a nation was born. The Jews continue to flock to that place. There's a day when even more will be there. And because more will be there, the hatred will be greater than ever. Number two, the Antichrist will make a seven-year covenant of peace with Israel. Some of you might say, oh, I remember where that is. That takes place after the rapture of the church. Yes, you've got it right. The temple will be rebuilt. Even now, if you're on the internet looking up articles, look, because there's often a little article that will talk about the dilemma. Will there ever be a temple in Israel? That temple is a, a, a sacred site to the Muslims. All you'd have to do is swing one sledgehammer in that place and the world would burst into a great conflict. But the articles will keep coming. The news articles will be there because God has prophesied Jesus in this discourse says, oh, there's a day coming when there will be a new temple built for a new purpose. The Antichrist will break his covenant with Israel. And the worldwide persecution of Israel will result. We understand that's the middle of the tribulation. This begins the great tribulation. Israel then will finally recognize Jesus as their Messiah. Israel will be regenerated, restored, and regathered. That's all happening in that thousand-year reign. So those are some key points for the nation of Israel. Now, when it comes to the church, and remember, these ropes are intertwined with the sovereignty of God. These are things that God has declared. It doesn't matter if we like them. It doesn't matter if we fully understand them. The truth is, these things will take place. Israel will always be in the middle of controversy. Israel will always have a growing list of enemies seeking to destroy it. That's a part of the political world we live in. But the church will also be doing its work until the day of Christ's return in regards to the rapture. So, number one, Christ will remove born again, all born again believers from the earth in an event known as the rapture. At that time, there's a judgment. The judgment isn't to pay for the sins of earth. Those were taken care of at Calvary. The salvation, the forgiveness covers all time, past, present, and future. But your life is going to be evaluated. Someone's going to judge whether or not you spent your time, your energy, your opportunities well or not. It will be an embarrassing time. Beth and I were at a at dental appointments, and it was a new place, and they were taking all of our history, and they said, and what is your weight? I mean, do you want to say your weight out loud? I don't want to say mine. I mean, some of you do, and some of you would be glad to share your weight, and if you do, we'll hate you for it, all right? No problem there. But he said, uh, she said, uh, and your weight? I prefaced it with, you know, I have really broad shoulders. <laughs> it didn't change anything. She goes, really? I wouldn't have guessed, which means I carry my fat very well. That's what that means. But, you know, it's, it's an embarrassing time to have your body evaluated. Now, I did say I weigh less without my clothes. And she said, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> You just estimate. I said, okay. 
But, I mean, none of us like those kinds of moments where we're being evaluated. Well, there's a big moment where our lives are going to be evaluated, the judgment seat of Christ. Not your sin. Your sin, thank you, is taken away forever by the shed blood of Christ. But your effort will be evaluated. We know that's coming. Number two, that the Antichrist will come into power, will sign a covenant with Israel for seven years. It's during this time that the mark will be given to those who are behind. If they will not receive the mark, they will be hunted by this unholy trinity of the beast, the false teacher, all of these working in harmony with Satan, with the Antichrist. So he says that day is coming, a day of absolute chaos. The world will begin to shake and fall apart. Diseases will come out of nowhere because they are the judgment of God. The place is going to be turned upside down. Halfway through that, that seven-year period of time, the Antichrist will break the covenant of peace with Israel. And then the war starts. The abomination of desolation. It's not long until we see Armageddon on the horizon. And then ultimately the Lord will come back in his power and glory. And the enemies will be defeated and put away for a thousand years. And that will begin the millennium. You can just he hear how those two intertwine with one another. It's really two stories that become one story. Because it is the story of God. So Jesus gave the Olivet Discourse to all of these people. And now the question is, how do we live with that understanding? With the understanding that the world is not just happening, that circumstances are not managing history. It is the hand of God that manages history. That all of history is moving to a time when there will be a new heaven and a new earth. That sin will be judged in this world once and for all. Because Satan and all of those that align with him will be gone. So how do we live as pilgrims in this world? How do we live as those people who know our real home is a place we've never seen. When Mrs. Bugno passed away, I saw the family yesterday. They had a private graveside ceremony. And every single person in the family that I spoke to said, we, were, we just rejoiced when grandma died. We rejoiced when mom died. I mean, there was an understanding that Eleanor Bugno was going to a better place. And it was her place because of her faith in Christ. So that's how we live. We live with heaven in mind. We live with holiness in mind. Living in a world where there is no wrong. Think about your life. Think about all of the unfair things that have happened. Think about all of the tragedies that have been a part of your story. Hey, do any of us want to live here forever? No. Let's get out of this place. Let's go to a place where the world is ruled by the goodness and the righteousness of God. The new heaven, the new earth. So, open up your notes. People get ready. Now, here is my challenge. It won't take us long to read it. We won't make many comments as we read it. It really is self-explanatory. Everything here you see in the little fine print, the chapters, the verses it comes from. I did this a long time ago when I was preparing for another lesson on prophecy. And I put all these words together. And when you see what's written in this letter, you'll say, oh, that one speaks of the church in the prophecies given to us as members of the church. Oh, that is a prophecy given to the nation of Israel. But we know that those two stories are really one story. But when you read through this, it will challenge you. I believe that. Here is my challenge to each one of us. I've already started. Uh, <laughs> 
which is easy. Day one is, is easy to accomplish, all right? But there are about not quite 50 sentences in this letter. I am going to challenge you to memorize all 50 sentences. Just start off one at a time. Now, I tell you that, and it convicts me, because I am terrible at memorization. I have tried and failed so many times. Beth was sharing with me at this conference that she heard a lady speak and how that had changed her life and had changed so many things in her family. And the lady started saying, not in a braggy way, not in a dynamic way, that she had memorized this book of the Bible and this book of the Bible and this book of the Bible. And now she was aiming for, I don't know, 1 Corinthians, all of the chapters there. And I thought, how does she do that? Well, you know what? She does it because it's important and she wants to. So now my wife, as you know, is really the spiritual giant in the dynamics here. She's been quoting to me, oh, I've been learning these verses. And she's quoting what she's memorized. And then she tells me what she has learned because she is meditating on those words. And guess who looks like a spiritual pygmy? So my arrogant spiritual pride, well, that's a great motivation, isn't it? Says, Bruce, you ought to be memorizing. Instead of telling everybody else to do it, just do it. So next week, come up out of the blue and say, hey, quote for me the first six, by that point, six sentences. If I start coughing, you know I can't do it. But I'm challenging everybody here. You want your life to be changed? You want to know how to spend your days, your energy, your time? Let's start with this. It's a long letter, but it is just that. Many of you can quote famous lines out of movies. Many of you can quote words out of songs. Listen, people of God, we have an obligation to be ready for the days that God has planned. So that's the challenge. Here is the letter. Just listen as I read and you can follow along. People get ready. I mean, get ready because these things will take place and this is how we should live. Dear friend, and if you notice at the very end of the letter that it's sincerely yours, the word of God. Again, none of these are paraphrased on my part. All of these come out of the Bible that we so often use here, the New Living Translation. For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom and righteousness and devotion to God while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us his very own people totally committed to doing good deeds. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth that he has promised. A world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives 
that are pure and blameless in sight. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against his will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when God will join, or the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct show they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. But we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus lives. And we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak, mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Sincerely yours, the word of God. Is there not great power in reading and hearing the word of God? Does it not stir you up to live a life? Does it not make you ready to get on board the train? So, the challenge. You've got an hour, at least, in every day that you waste Truth is, if you live the way most of us do, you've got a couple of hours that are just your hours to do with whatever you want. Would you consider getting a note card, whatever works for you, and just start writing that first sentence and say, Lord, this is my effort. You must bless my effort because in my weakness, I can't do this. But Lord, I want to be living your lifestyle. 
I want to be ready for the day when the Lord Jesus comes because I know he is coming. And I know my heart is ready, but my house may not be in order. Allow the word of God to order your life, to order your days, to order your house. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads, please? Now, I know there's been a lot of reading, a lot of information given to you today. But if you're attentive, you can see the theme. The theme is Jesus came to accomplish something. He came to accomplish something in the nation of Israel. But he was not fooled by their willingness to turn away. He said over and over again, I have come to seek and to save the lost. I was born with Calvary in mind. That's why I left the glories of heaven. I've come that I might be the perfect Lamb of God. He did that for us. We know that. I trust you know it personally, that that application has been made in your heart, your mind, in your life. But now, what do we do while we wait? Grow in despair? No. Let's do something more than that. Let's, the, let's live with eternity in mind. Let's live with the new heaven and the new earth as our destination. Let's live and make our lives count as we reach those in our family, those we work with. Let us allow the word of God to do the work in our hearts. Father, I'm asking that you would bless Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be the one to motivate people and to, to provide and to encourage people. Lord, those of us who have already made a commitment to do the hard work of memorization, Lord, you know how many times we've failed before, but Lord, give us a determination. Lord, help us to find each other that we might encourage one another in this most important work. And this I ask for in Jesus' name. Amen. Well. I trust you have a great day. Don't forget, next week, 1130, we say a prayer here. We go down and enjoy a great meal together. As always, you're so good to us. Beth and I want to thank you for your kindness. God bless you.